I said, where are your men? They said, they're doing a truce, they're doing an agreement, they're doing a treaty. They had these words. I didn't know what they were talking about. They said, the gangs, Miss Rice, the gangs, Miss Rice. I said, oh, oh, the gang, oh, okay. So they said, yeah, yeah, the Grape Street Crips and the Blood Bounty Hunters, two housing projects, four blocks apart from one another. The kids couldn't even walk to school because they're feuding over territory. And they're fighting over crack, the crack wars. 80% of that economy in that area is underground. And 65% of it, this is 20 years ago, 65% of that 80% underground economy has to do with guns, drugs, and stolen cars. So it's a vast, it's a, the economy is attached to crime at an organic level. I had these stats in my head, but I was seeing the reality on the ground. So, Ms. Ferragamo St. John says, well, where are they? They said, in the bunker behind Markham Junior High School. I said, well, show me where it is. So I walk around the block, and there's this junior high school. It's one of the worst in the country. And behind it was this bungalow, this portable trailer. And they said, they're in there. I said, OK. I pick up my little briefcase, and I walk up, and I, I knock on the door, and it opens. And there's this guy with a, what they call a wife beater tank top and pants that are belted at his buttocks. And, baggy pants, and he's got this red bandana tied around his head. I said, hi, I'm Connie Rice. I'm an attorney, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> he slammed the door in my face, and I thought, oh, strike two. But I heard them talking. I heard them talking. And so I waited before I left. And the door opened a couple of minutes, and he, flew, he, he flung it wide open. And I'm standing here, and there's this trailer, and I can now see inside the trailer. It was an absolute packed with gangsters, with red bandanas and blue bandanas. The red bandanas were on the right, the blue bandanas were on the left. They had them tied on their biceps, which were all huge. Uh, they were all, they were, some of them had them tied around their heads. They had all these tattoos, and I thought, oh my. And so he said, tell them what you said. I said to the whole group, I, I knew better than to step into the trailer, so... I'm standing outside in the door now, and I'm now addressing this confab, this convention of gangsters. And I said, my name is Connie Rice, and I'm with the Legal Defense Fund. I knew better than to put in NAACP there after my last reception. And I said, I'm here to help. I understand you're negotiating a truce. The women have, your women have asked me to come help you. And they kind of looked. Real hard faces, no receptivity whatsoever. And I'm looking at the guns everywhere. You know, I'm thinking, oh my God, they've taken over this trailer. The principal's probably so terrified of them. She didn't know, she didn't have the nerve to tell them to get out. Finally, one of them leans forward and says, you an attorney? I said, yes. He said, uh, yeah, here's something you can do. I said, what is it? He said, can you get us that agreement between the Arabs and the Jews? I said, would you be referring to the Egyptian-Israeli peace accords? I said, no. He said, yeah, 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 that one. I said, yes, I can get that. He said, well, if the Jews and the Arabs can get along, we can do a treaty like that. That began my venture with these men. I left, came back the next day. Fred Williams followed me out, this huge guy, bald head, uh, he'd, he'd been out of prison for seven years, but he'd gone for armed robbery, had done a 10-year stint. And, but he had middle-class mannerisms, and he said, look, you're going to need me to be the translator. And he was my ambassador. And as I learned his world, he had to learn mine, we figured out how to make that truce go. I was just their scribe. I was, I was in meetings where they were talking about how to build up to a Sicilian code of killing. And I'm thinking, I'm an officer of the court, and I'm sitting here listening to these guys decide when it's OK to murder one another. I said, I really can't do this. But the women needed a code. No babies, no children, no teenagers. Don't take anybody under the age of 15. They were trying to work their way up to a code that controlled the killing. That's what those women needed me to do. A long time of dealing with these guys. And I looked at them, and my feminist friend said, Connie, what are you doing? And I'm a feminist. I'm the black Murphy Brown. I'm your worst nightmare. I really am. Pete will tell you. All the men in my life will tell you. 
And as a feminist, with, with all my feminist friends, it was like, what are you doing with these gangsters who they call us bitches and hoes and the rap music is terrible? And I said, listen, here's my bet. Here's my bet. If I help them fight their annihilation, they will on their own terms come to gender equity. I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to preach to them. They cannot mistreat women in front of me and they have to treat me with respect. But they are facing total annihilation. And this community has a level of violence that exceeds civil war levels. I've got to keep my eye on that. And the women have asked me to help these men. And if I'm going to help lead them to a different way of thinking, I have to stick with them. I have to show them that I'm going to help them out of their predicament. And they will learn from my presence. And they will also come to it on their own terms. That was my bet. I had no basis for it. We went through the truce. The truce lasted 10 years. We went through gang intervention training. I got these guys to organize themselves. I had to get the police to stop arresting them. I was their bodyguard. When they did midnight basketball, they had to keep the truce going by getting people who were slated to kill one another to, to actually play on a team together, sports instead of war. You know, it's really what football is about. It's much better than war, so I, I, I've stopped talking badly about football because now I understand it's a good outlet for it. They had football teams. They had basketball. I would go down there at midnight. I would have lawyers lining the gym so that when LAPD came in, he, they wouldn't round them up and destroy the games because the police were afraid of the truce because they were afraid if the guys stopped trying to kill each other, they might try to kill the cops. I hadn't worked out the relationship with the police yet. But out of that work came an amazing day. We ended up developing a life skills course that taught these men how to look at themselves. We called it predator to peacemaker. How do you get them to change how they see themselves? How do you give them the tools to try a positive way of exercising male power? How do you get them to let the violence go because they're addicted to the violence? It's the only thing that affirms their masculinity. We have emasculated these men, and when you emasculate men, they hit back at you with a hyper-masculinity. It's what you see internationally, it's what you see in the ghetto, and in the barrio, and in the prisons. So we created a life skills course, Jim Brown and Alvin Poussant and some others in public health. They created a life skills course and we got into the prisons. And this course, the deputies didn't want it there. And it took super maximum security and maximum security prisoners. And it taught them, in because they're shackled, we got them to get the shackles off. And through a four week course, these men would stand up at a podium. Some had never a given a public speech before. And they would say how they had never been taught to analyze the situation and think before acting. Stuff you and I learned before five. Our parents taught us. This life skills course, the deputies ended up stopped fighting it. And I came to one of the graduations. And a, and a, and a, and a prisoner got up and he said, he, start, he was reading very haltingly. And he said, he started reading, he was thanking the American program for the life skills course, thanking Sheriff Baca for letting the course into the prison. And then he put the paper down and he said, but what I really want to do, I want to thank Deputy Green for bringing me a hot water bottle when the infirmary was full and I had the flu. And everybody gripped their chairs. And then they burst into applause, and the deputies burst into applause. And the Deputy Green came up and put his arm around the prisoner and he said, and I want to thank him for talking down a fight. He talked down a fight. He took what he learned from this course. Now, that may not sound extraordinary to you, but in that course, in that prison, you can get killed for thanking a deputy. And a deputy will be taken into the locker room and beat down by other deputies, other guards, for showing kindness to a prisoner. So through that course, we had changed both mindsets. And it was from the guys I started with in Watts that we did this course with Jim Brown. Ten years later, they said, Connie, are you coming to a meeting? Connie, are you coming to a meeting? I said, it's Saturday. Why do I have to go to the Futurama Hotel out of the airport? They said, you got to come. you got to come. I said, what are you talking about? You know you got to I said, if you call me one more time, I'm, they really wanted me to come to this meeting, and I didn't want to go because it's 40 miles from my house to the, I really wanted to rest that Saturday. So I'm driving to the airport. I'm furious, fussing and cussing the whole way. What the hell do they want now? I get there. There's this tacky, ticky, tacky hotel out here on Airport Boulevard. It's just the tackiest thing I do. I said, what is we doing? 
this flea bag motel? What are we doing here? I, I, you know, so I'm marching up the stairs, and I'm like, what do they want? And I'm stomping up the stairs, and I, I open the room. I thought it was going to be a meeting room. It was a ballroom. And it, it was a ballroom bigger than this room. And it was filled with tables with pink tablecloths and white roses. And I looked up on the stage, and there's this huge banner with three misspelled words. <laughs> but the banner said, to the women who loved us when we didn't deserve to be loved, thank you for staying with us. They invited their grandmothers, their mothers, their babies' mamas. They, they invited their girlfriends. They invited their sisters. They invited law, women lawyers like me. They invited some female politicians. And they filled that ballroom with the women in their lives. And they got on their knees and they asked for forgiveness. And they said things like, I beat you because I didn't, because you reminded me of what I couldn't do to be a man. And I should never have touched you. It was wrong. Can you forgive me? I left you. I fathered children with other women. You know, they just, on their knees in tears, these big ex-convict men, and they came to the point where they said they were supporting their children and they had transformed themselves. And Rock came up to me, this big, big, big guy. He'd never say anything to me. Most of these guys, they wouldn't talk to me because I'm, I'm, I talk too fast. I, they think I'm white. They don't know what I am, but they know their leaders need me. So they, they would always make way. They would guard my car. But most of them couldn't talk to me. Rock was one of these guys. He was like 6'5", big as shack, you know, walking wall of a guy. And he comes over, and there's this hand on my shoulder. And I look up, and I, Rock, I haven't, you know, I, we would always nod respectfully. And, you know, it was always, but I never, in 10 years, I'd never spoken to this man because he didn't want to talk to me. And he, he tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, lady lawyer. And honorific in that world. I'm delighted with that title, by the way. Lady lawyer, may I speak to you? I said, Rock, of course. He said, I am not the predator you met 10 years ago. I am now a peacemaker, and I am now fit to speak to you. I didn't well up like this because you can't show that you're weak in front of these men. So I, I just swallowed my shock, and I said, you were always fit to speak to me, Rock but you have been on an incredible journey.